in this lecture we're going to talk about chapter 5 of the textbook in a little bit and this chapter is ionization. Now most biomolecules are ionized or can be ionized depending on the pH. It's one of the unique things of biomolecules. We'll discuss a little bit about why that is true but that actually aids their um, solubility in an aqueous solution. So it's very important to understand the principles of ionization, which frankly are poorly taught in most chemistry uh, courses. All right. So first, let's talk a little bit about water. Water is considered the kind of the universal biomolecular solvent. Biology evolved in an aqueous system. It evolved in the ocean. Now we should remember that an ocean is salty. It has ions present. Okay, but Water is the dominant solvent that's there. Even the cytoplasm of cells is mostly water, anywhere from 65 to 80 percent water. Your body is in the on the order of about 80 percent water. Okay, water is the dominant solvent in the system. All the biochemistry that's going on is going on in water. But water is really a very unique solvent. Okay. It has, it's not very unique in its dispersive parameter. There's a whole chapter, chapter three, that discusses solubility space and solubility and solubility parameters. Hansen solubility space is kind of the dominant one that we talk about now. These are thermodynamic state properties of, of solvents and of solutes. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it here except to show you that water is really unique in this space. Okay, it has an average uh, dispersive parameter, but it's, it's at the extremes of both the polar and, more importantly, the hydrogen bonding parameter. It's the most hydrogen bonding of all solvents. Now, most biomolecules contain amines, alcohols, carboxylic acid groups. These, quote, heteroatoms is the way they're described in, in synthetic chemistry. Okay, these heteroatoms readily hydrogen bond both to each other and to water. If water wasn't present, they would be hydrogen bonding to each other, and everything in the cell would kind of be bound up into almost a solid-like consistency. Water lubricates that. It interrupts the hydrogen bonding between biomolecules because it's, it's present in such high concentration and it can hydrogen bond instead to those functional groups. All right, water is also unique in that it's both a proton donor and a proton acceptor. So it can actually, one water molecule can give up a hydrogen in the form of a proton to another water molecule leaving behind its electron, the electron associated with that hydrogen, to produce a hydroxide ion. Okay, these are, this is something that's, that's fairly unique in nature where you're, the, the sol a very tiny solvent like this can act as both a proton donor and a proton acceptor, which is one of the reasons that water is the, quote, universal solvent. And water is very important, or hydration is very important in bioseparations. This is a constraint on biological separations that's really not imposed on synthetic chemical separations. So if you're dealing with synthetic chemicals, you don't have to worry so much about water being around to maintain the integrity of the, of the functional activity of the molecules that you're trying to resolve. Okay, we can describe this proton donation process. Since this is an equilibrium, we can describe the pKa of water, okay, and the Ka of water is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 16 molar, and that has to be equal to the product of the products of reaction. In other words, the hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxyl ion concentration divided by the concentration of water left behind after the ionization. Now this ionization constant is so low that we very often treat the concentration of water as constant. 
okay, at about at, at standard temperature and pressure, this is about 55.5 molar. And by doing that, we can define a Kw of water by taking that 55.5 and multiplying it by the Ka of water, and that works out to be 10 to the negative 14 molar squared. And that's equal to the product of the hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxyl ion concentration. Okay, as most of you know, if I take the negative, the log base 10 of those concentrations, I get pH and pOH. And if I take negative, the log of both sides of this equation, I get 14 because 10 to the negative, the negative, the, the log of 10 to the four, negative 14 is 14. And this is the equation that you see in introductory chemistry textbooks where 14 is equal to the sum of the, of the pH plus the pOH. So if my pH is 1, my pOH must be um, 13, okay? Which means that the hydroxyl ion concentration is 10 to the negative 13. It's very, very low. The hydrogen ion concentration would be 10 to the negative 1, so that's very high in, by comparison. So this is where this equation arises. It's really poor to use that equation because that equation really only applies to a pure water solution. It's much better to work with the actual Ka of water and we'll see that as we move on in this lecture. Now let's get a feel for where, what bi what, where biomolecules like to exist. If 14 is equal to pH plus pOH, if the hydrogen ion concentration equals the hydroxyl ion concentration, then pH and pOH have to be equal, and that's pH 7, because 7 plus 7 is 14, so that tells us where are, where's the solution neutral. The hydrogen ion concentration equals the hydroxyl ion concentration. So 7 is kind of the midpoint of this 0 to 14 range. The range actually goes below 0 and above 14. Okay, those we'll talk a little bit about that as we move on here. It kind of depends what we're dealing with and how much water is present. Life evolved in the physiological range, which is depending who you talk to. If you're talking to a physician, that might be 7 to 9. If you're talking to a microbiologist, it may be more 6 to 10. Okay, so in that pH range, that's where life evolves. Seawater is somewhere between 7 and 8. Okay, your, most of your tissues exist around pH 7. Your blood's around pH 7.2 or 7.4. That's the physiological pH range for tissues, for cells. That's what the cytoplasm of the cell, the inside of a cell, looks like. That's where biomolecules evolved. It's in that kind of pH. That's where they're happiest, and we'll see why in a minute. Now, the periplasm is kind of the exception. If you think about the proton motive force, the, the cytoplasm pumps protons into the periplasm of the cell. The periplasm then, you know, the, the cell derives energy by pulling those, allowing those protons to pass back through the membrane. So the periplasm is always at a lower pH, higher proton ion concentration, lower pH, than the cytoplasm is. And that's how the cell actually derives thermodynamic energy that way. And that's actually the primary source of energy for most cells is the proton motive force. So as we go up, we start to see things like tomato juice, uh, vinegar, um, which is about 6% acetic acid, is pH around 3. Um, gastric juices are, are really an exception, okay? Your stomach is a very low pH. It's two, a pH of 1 to 2. When you get an upset stomach, you add a bunch of hydroxyl ions. So that's, why, that's where milk of magnesia comes in. That's where Tums comes in. They they bring in hydroxyl ions that lower, that buffer the pH and produce more water. Um, on the other extremes, we start seeing things like household ammonia for cleaning glass, cleaning things. 
uh, household bleach is very uh, high pH, oven cleaners even higher. These are really caustic. You have to wear gloves when you're using them, otherwise they burn holes in your skin, that kind of thing. So in terms of where we do most bioseparations, we do most bioseparations in that neutral pH range, either 6 to 10 or 7 to 9, depending how you want to define it. We tend not to not to deviate too low or too high because biomolecules tend not to like those regimes. So that's a constraint on bioseparations that's not really present in traditional synthetic organic chemistry type separations where we don't necessarily deal with things that are that are happiest in an aqueous system. Now why is this the case? Well let's look at our pH range here and here I've expanded the range a little bit and what we see here is biomolecules tend to have a lot of these functional groups around. They have carboxylic acids which ionize at a low pH to become ions, car uh, carboxylate ions, in the physiological pH range. Similarly, we have a lot of aliphatic amines, primary, secondary, and tertiary, which ionize just above the physiological pH range. So they tend to be, these bases tend to be uh, ionized in the physiological pH range. Now, why is that? Well, it actually aids the solubility of these molecules. If these are not ionized, we're, we're down to you know, a fatty acid of some sort or a benzoic acid, they don't like to be in water. Okay, in order to pull them into an aqueous solution, we want to ionize them. So we want the pH to be higher to make those ions. We don't want it to go too high because then these amines are not protonated and this looks more like a synthetic organic material which is not water soluble depending how long the R chains are. Okay, so we want those to be ionized to, to, so that the molecule itself wants to be more soluble in an aqueous system. Now, this is not true of aromatic amines. Aromatic amines are net neutral in this, this region. Now, think about where would we see a lot of aromatic type amines. Well, the nucleoside bases are mostly aromatic amines. They tend not to want to be ionized in this region. Um, that's one of the, the forces that keeps the DNA and the RNA compact. It's, it's part of the reason the Watson chain and the Crick ch chain of DNA want to bind to each other. It's why you get those hairpin turns in RNA. It's because they don't really want to be in that physiological pH regime, so they tend to collapse on themselves. Um, I've kind of avoided alcohols here. Alcohols tend to be soluble mostly because of hydrogen bonding interactions. They're, they can they can share their hydrogen with other uh, other water molecules. Um, it's not an ionization; it's just a sharing. Phenol actually is uh, just outside the pH range. Phenols tend to be ionized. If they're substituted, they can move. That can move into the pH into the physiological pH range. Most aliphatic alcohols are unionized in the physio physiological range. And an alcohol is kind of like water. It can also accept a proton, but it doesn't really like doing that. You have to be at a very, very low pH before that happens. So alcohols tend not to ionize in the uh, physiological pH range, but they can be ionized well outside of that. Now, up till now, we've only looked at kind of these single functional groups, okay? There are a lot of molecules, and a lot of biomolecules in particular, contain multiple functional groups. They may have both amines and acids on them. They may have pendant phosphates on them. Um, phosphate is a great example of a multiply ionizable species. We start with phosphoric acid, which is net neutral. At a pH around 2.15, it will start to ionize to produce the, the first ion of, of phosphoric acid, that PO4 negative, or H2PO4 negative, can then go undergo a second ionization at a pKa of about 7.2 to become a 
doubly negatively charged anion. The doubly negatively charged anion can then, at a higher pH, give up a thir its third proton to become triply negatively charged. Okay, this is a multiple a species with multiple ionizations. This is a simple or inorganic one. Okay, now imagine if you think about a protein structure, some of the residues on a protein are negatively charged, glutamic uh, acid being one. Some are positively or can be positively charged, lysine, histidine, arginine are examples of that. Okay, those groups then on a, if they're if they're attached to the same protein molecule impart the possibility of multiple positive and multiple negative charges to the same biomolecule okay so we have to we, we have to worry about the number of ionizable groups the number of total charges that are around because the more charge that's there the more water soluble it's going to be whether it's a positive charge or a negative charge um, and what the pH is because that that uh, the, the net charge of the molecule because if you have both positive charges and negative charges they attract one another okay so that's part of the structure of a protein is the charge interactions of the residues okay it can also lead to precipitation of a protein because if there's no intervening buffer to break it up positive charges like negative charges okay so you have to worry about those kinds of things when we're dealing with biomolecule separations all right. Now, a molecule is not, or an individual molecule may be charged or uncharged, but a group of molecules or a Avogadro's number of molecules, okay, on average, all of those molecules are spending part of their time as ions and part of their time as net neutrals. The fractional ionization then, how much time it spends one, in one state or another state, or the fraction of the total ions that are ionized versus unionized, okay, is an important parameter. It's important for a lot of separations that we do. Now, if we have an acid or a proton donor, we can write our equilibrium in a general term where the net neutral acid, one with the proton attached, produces an anion, the negatively charged ion, okay, plus gives up its proton to the solution. Now that proton can go off and do other things. It could find another anion and attach to it to neutralize it. Okay, it could find a totally different uh, uh, anion and neutralize that. All right. So here, this is given by a Ka. We've seen this equation before. The concentration of hydrogen ions, we can substitute 10 to the negative pH for that. We can now, now the problem is we don't know the concentration of the anion. And as we produce the anion here, we diminish how much of the neutral acid we have. But those two are related to one another. Okay, so we can write a material balance for the total acid concentration, the, the total amount of acid that we add, or the concentration of that in the solution, because we know what we added, and that has to be the it has to be in one of two states. It's either neutral or it's the anion state. We can solve for the for the neutral state in terms of the anion state, since we know what CT is. Okay, and we can now, now we can now redefine this equation in terms of the fraction of the total that is ionized, and that's 10 to the negative pKa divided by, which is a constant, divided by 10 to the negative pH plus 10 to the negative pKa. Okay. Now the same thing is true for bases. Okay, it's just a little inverted. Now a base starts as a charged cation and it gives up a proton to become a net neutral. We can write out the uh, equilibrium expression for that just like we did before, substituting 10 to the negative pH for the concentration of the protons that are produced. Again, we know the total amount of base added, but we don't know how much is in each form. So we can solve for the neutral in terms of the positively charged cation concentration and the total and define a fractional ionization for the base in terms of the total base present 
Now here it's 10 to the negative pH divided by the sum of the 10 to the negative pH plus 10 to the negative pKa. All right. So the form of the equation is very similar, but it's subtly different. Here we have pKa in the numerator, here we have pH in the numerator. Now let's think about these equations a little bit. If, if pH is, is um, very large compared to pKa, okay, then 10 to the negative pH is very small, because it's a negative number here, 10 to the negative pH is very small compared to 10 to the negative pKa. So at high pH, we have 10 to the negative pKa divided by 10 to the negative pKa, because this term becomes, the 10 to the negative pH term becomes negligible, and the fractional ionization of an acid goes to 1. Where pH is a very small number compared to pKa, the pKa term can be neglected, and we have 10 to the negative pKa divided by 10 to the negative pH, which is a very large number, and the fractional ionization goes to zero, or it gets very, very small. So fractional ionization is always between zero and one. Now the opposite is true for bases. So the fractional ionization of a base, okay, if the pH is very large compared to the pKa, 10 to the negative pH is very small, and we have 10 to the negative pH, which is a small number, divided by 10 to the negative pKa, which is a constant, and fractional ionization of the base goes to zero. If pH is very small, 10 to the negative pH is very large compared to pKa. The pKa can be neglected, and the fractional ionization then goes to one. So bases add protons to become ionized at low pH, acids give up protons to become ionized at high pH. All right, so now let's deal with the case of multiple dependent ionizations. So this is our phosphate is a great example of this where we have we can generate different charge states depending on the pH and each depends on how much of the previous one is present. All right, so we can write out the, our standard equilibrium expressions here. And now over here, I've done something a little bit different. Let me put that away. I've done something a little bit different, okay? I'm gonna define the concentration of H3PO4 plus concentration of H2PO4 negative as the total H3PO4 in the system. I'm ignoring the other charge states. So I'll call that F1 because I, I'm not defining it in total in, in terms of total phosphate. I'm defining it in terms of total anion plus neutral. Okay? We can, and that we find is very similar to what we saw before. We can do the same thing for F2 for the fractional ionization too, if we only deal with these two species or the sum of those two species as our quote total. All right, and we can do that for the third ionization. Now, the problem is I have to write my material balance in terms of the total phosphate present in the system, and it could be in any of these four species. Okay, if I divide through by total phosphate, then I get one has to equal the fractional ionization of, of each of these defined in terms of total phosphate. Now, the, it turns, if you do the math, we, we go through this in the textbook, if we do the math, it turns out that the highest charge state has to be the product of the fractional ionization of each preceding charge state, okay? The second intermediate charge state, you subtract out the, or it becomes a little more complicated, but you can calculate that. And the next charge state can be calculated as well. Okay, so this, these are the formulas that convert F1, F2, F3 into F, H, PO4, or whatever. All right, so now once we have those three, all we have left to do is solve for the net neutral, which we can do from equation four. Uh, 
and we can solve for the net neutral and we know the fractions of all the different charge states. This is one way to do multiple dependent ionizations. It's not the only way to do it, but it turns out this is a fairly straightforward way when you get into very, very complex ionizations. Now, once we identify that we can have multiple independent ionizations, that's what we did previously in that multiple ionization example, is we treated each ionization as an independent uh, thing. They're, they're, they don't depend on one another, they're independent. Okay, once we have that, situation. You have a biomolecule contains multiple ionizable groups. There are two things we need to define and one of those is the net charge on that molecule. Now we've talked about how acids and bases can have fractional ionizations. So the sum of the positive fractional positive charges minus the fractional negative charges is the net charge on that molecule. The net charge has implications in things like electrophoresis. It has imp uh, implications in things like solubility because two molecules that are net positively charged tend not to want to come together because of charge repulsion. Um, so there, there are issues around net charge that are different from total charge. Okay, total charge, if you have, if you're doing ion exchange, for example, the total number of positive charges independent of the negative charges is important to know. So if you have a if you have a lot of positive charges around it will want to bind to the resin more than something that has few positive charges around. It will elute slower from a ion exchange column than a less total number of positive charges would. Total charges also have big implications for solubility, particularly in an aqueous solution. So we have to, we really have to deal with net charge and total charge. And a good example here is an amino acid. So if you look at a generic amino acid, now I'm assuming here the R group, the, the, the residue on the amino acid is uncharged. At low pH, the acid will accept a proton to become neutral but the amine will be positively charged. So it would have a net charge of plus one and a total charge of one. Now, at this intermediate pH range, both the amine, the alpha amine, and the carboxylic acid will be ionized. So it has a net charge of zero, but because it has two total charges, it would have a higher solubility in an aqueous solution or in an aqueous buffer solution. This would be a higher, more soluble molecule than this would be. Now if we raise the pH a little bit more, okay, we have the amine will become deprotonated and, but the carboxylic acid will stay deprotonated. Okay, so now it goes from a plus one charge to a zero charge to a minus one charge and the total charge goes back to one. Okay, so we we can see that biomolecules will often vary their charge state from plus to minus depending on the pH. That can be, that can be readily exploited in things like electrophoretic separations of biomolecules to separate two biomolecules that are nearly identical just by, by putting the pH such that one's positively charged and one's negatively charged. All right. Now, a net charge of zero, oops, sorry, a net charge of zero has a unique definition. Where the t where the frac the sum of the positive fractional charges equals the sum of the negative fractional charges, that's called the isoelectric point or the pH P pi is isoelectric point, but that's the pH at which the molecule becomes net neutral. Okay, and this has has real importance when you get into things like proteins. So to sum this up, total charge plays a critical role in solubility, ion exchange, and buffer strength. Net charge plays a critical role in electroneutrality, ion mobility, and pH determination. Um, so these, these concepts are important concepts to get down, to understand the difference between net and total charges. Depending what you're dealing with, one may be much more important than the other.
All right, so let's talk a little bit about isoelectric point. And here, um, this is, as I said, this is where the sum of the positive charges equals the sum of the negative charges on a given molecule. Okay, and it's where, so the, basically the, the sum of positive minus the sum of negative um, has to go to zero. This is of particular importance in proteins, okay, and other polyionic species, but we really deal with it a lot in proteins. So in the textbook, we go through an example, table 5.1, uh, describing how this is all calculated, but I've actually put all this into a spreadsheet along with some other protein properties that you can calculate in the spreadsheet um, to make it easier for, for uh, people to use. And so just it, what's important here is the, P, the isoelectric point of this particular peptide, and I've got the sequence of the peptide um, over here. The isoelectric point for this sequence, this peptide sequence, remember the N-terminus and the C-terminus can be ionized, so we have to account for those. The iso predicted isoelectric point is 7.278. Okay, that's where the, pos the negative charges equals the positive charges. So let's look at this in the spreadsheet. Here we have our same sequence, and but you notice I put in a isoelectric point of 7, but the net charge is not 0. Okay, now the spreadsheet works as a lookup table. So for those of you who understand Excel, there's a lookup table. We're looking up over to this set of values over here, and this has our sequence in it. This has the ionization constant for each of these R groups. Now it's an approximation. It turns out these ionization constants can vary a little bit depending on what what the nearest neighbor effects are in the structure of the protein, but this is kind of the average number that's cited. Um, we have the charge on the, once it is ionized, what's its charge, either positive or negative. And there are some other properties here like the molecular weight of the residue and the hydropathy index. Those are discussed in the book. Uh, I'm not going to get into those here, but you can calculate all these properties for a particular peptide or protein using the spreadsheet. So pH 7, this, is, this uh, peptide would be positively charged. Okay, if we go to Solver, which is an add-in, uh, an optimization tool in Excel, and what we want is we want to set that net charge by varying the pH, and we want to set that charge to a value of zero. So we can solve, and this is just going through an optimization routine, and There we go, it's done. The, P, uh, the isoelectric point is predicted to be 7.278, which is exactly what we had in our table. And here, you know, this is as close to zero as the optimizer will numerically get. That's pretty close to zero. It's 10 to the negative 8. Okay. Um, now, what if we were to change the sequence? So let's take out this arginine, let's put in a glutamic acid. Okay. Now, that peptide would be net negatively charged, almost a negative 2 value. So it has a different isoelectric point. So let's go back to Solver. If we go into Solver and we run it again, the isoelectric point now is 4.638. Okay, so if we were to separate these, these two peptides, all we have to do is put the pH one way or another, and we could electrophoretically remove the other peptide from the system, because a net neutral material will not move. And so pH is very important in a lot of separations. Okay, now this, these, this molecule is now zero in terms of its net charge at this pi. Okay, now we can go back, put that back, and if we wanted to, we could add another amino acid. So that's a single point mutation in a peptide causes that kind of PI difference. Now, obviously here I have changed for, actually, let's go back here and let's put in a valine. 
Valine has no charge associated with it. It's not ionizable. If I do that, I've taken out the arginine, which was ionizable, and I've replaced it with a valine, which is a net neutral. Okay, so if I run solver again, give it a minute, we see the PI is now intermediate between the glutamic acid version of the peptide and the arginine version of the peptide because we've, we've replaced two ionizable groups that were different charges with a net neutral. Okay, this spreadsheet can be easily modified. I can insert as many rows as I want. Insert cells. Shift it down, and I can put in, um, oh, let's try tryptophan, a tyrosine, whoops, um, serine, and threonine, and valine. So I'll just put in a few groups here. Tyrosine actually is ionizable. It has a phenol-like group, so at a certain pH it will become ionizable. And actually so is cysteine. So let's change this to a cysteine. Okay, cysteine is ionizable, but they're really only ionizable at fairly high pK, pHs or pKa's. All right, but it will alter our isoelectric point. So I can now look at this. I can run solver again. And what would be the isoelectric point of this new peptide, which is a little larger than the than one we started with, and it's back to close to where it was. It's about 7.195. Okay, so this is a powerful tool. At higher pHs, the peptide will be negatively charged. So if I were to go to, whoops, get out of this. Let's say I went to pH 8. You can see the peptide's now negatively charged. If I were to go to pH um, 6, pH is now, or the peptide is now positively charged. So isoelectric point has a huge impact on whether a molecule is positively or negatively charged, particularly proteins. And for electrophoretic separations, this is really a key effect um, for separating proteins. It's a very powerful tool. It's also, if we look at the total negative and total positive charges, it starts to tell us whether the um, peptide will will bind better to ion exchange or to anion exchange or cation exchange resins. So all of these are important properties that we have to consider when we're doing separations. Go back to our presentation and. The one thing I haven't talked about yet is the electroneutrality constraint. I think I've mentioned it a little bit along the way. It turns out that a solution that has positive and negative charges throughout that solution, even, even at a fairly local basis, the number of positive charges has to equal the number of negative charges. Those two things must be equal. They don't have to be on the same molecule. Matter of fact, they'll never be on the same molecule. If you have a sodium ion in the solution, the proton concentration has to drop and the hydroxide concentration has to go up. It's just by nature. Okay, it, The electroneutrality constraint is such that you have to have an equal number of positive and negative charges throughout that solution. Now, when you have multiple ionizable species, it becomes a little bit harder to predict what's going on. Um, but this is the basis of the Henderson Hasselbalch equation that you learned in basic chemistry for ionization. We can take this so much further. And um, by using this electroneutrality constraint, I should mention that water kind of makes up the difference. Okay, so if you're short on positive charges, water will produce some protons to neutralize it out. If you're short on negative charges, water will ionize to form, um, to form protons which bind to acids to neutralize the acid and leave hydroxide ions to replace them with. So there's a lot of, you know, there, there, water interacts with this. Organic solvents don't. 
So when you're dealing with non-ionizable organic solvents, you have to worry about where the counter ion charge is. With water, you don't have to worry quite as much, but it does make a big determination for pH. Now, we can use the electroneutrality constraint and we can use it to calculate the pH of any mixture of ionizable components, depending on how much we add. We can also use this to figure out how much of something do we need to reach a pH given what else is in the solution. And rather than, than present an example here, let's go to the pH calculator, which is available on the website, and we discuss in the book how to use that. So here we have our pH calculator, and I've added some things into this already. So if I have something that, that there's nothing in it but pure water, and pure water has a concentration of 55.5, and it's net neutral at pH of about 7. Okay, so here's the sum of the positive charges, here's the sum of the negative charges. If I add those two together, I have no error. So neutrality for pure water is pH 7. Okay, if I were to add, uh, let's say I wanted a 100 millimolar phosphate buffer, which is a common buffer, I put in 0.1 molar for the total phosphate. Okay, now what would be the pH if I was adding phosphoric acid? What would be the pH? Well, I go to solver. Okay, and in solver I say I want this cell, which is my error, to go to a value of zero by changing the pH. And I can solve that. Give it a minute. And it'll get there. There we go. And it says the pH of a 100 millimolar phosphoric acid solution would be 1.65. Well, I don't want pH of 1.65. I want something at around pH 7.2. That's where phosphate buffers really well. So if I want to be at 7.2, I put that in. I go to solver. Oops. And now I, I set my error. Okay, I've got an error here. I, set, I want to set that to a value of zero. But now I want to add sodium hydroxide. Now think about sodium hydroxide. Sodium ion is what's called a hard ion. It doesn't accept or donate a proton. Okay, it's just always a positive charge, so it has an infinite pKa. The hydroxide, however, will pick up protons to become neutral water. Okay, so it's really part of the water concentration. So by adding so many sodium ions in the form of sodium hydroxide, okay, I can alter the pH. Now, I can do that. Uh, let me find out how much sodium I need to end up with. So I'll run solver to make the pH 7.2. I need almost 0.15 molar sodium in my solution. So I need more sodium ions than I have phosphate ions around in order to make pH um, a pH of 7.2, say phosphate buffered citrate. Okay, so if I go down here to citric acid, that's another multiply charged thing. Let's just say acetate instead. Okay, so if I come down here and let's say I have 50 millimolar of acetate, okay, notice I've got it now an error up here. So how much more sodium would I have to add in order to compensate for that acetic acid? I can ask that question by going to solver and run it. And it will tell me that I need almost, I need 0.2 molar of sodium hydroxide in order to create a pH 7.2 by adding that extra acetic acid to the system. So this spreadsheet will work for pretty much any combination of acids and bases, whether they're, uh, whether they're hard ions, multiple ionizations,
Uh, you can add anything you want into this just by adding another row of materials and using the, the correct fractional ionization equations. And we've also got weak acids and bases and buffers. Okay, so I've got a lot of those already programmed in based on the tabulated pKa values. Now the other thing you get here is uh, the fraction that is in each ion state. So the triply charged phosphate, there's almost none of that around at this pH. There's roughly half is uh, double negatively charged and singly negatively charged phosphate. So this spreadsheet does a lot of things for you that make your calculations a lot easier when you're doing uh, mixed buffer systems. You don't have to worry about the limitations of Henderson-Hasselbalch and what do I add and you know what will work, what won't work. Um, you can you can also uh, look at things that are positively charged and would give you a basic solution. You could add HCl again. H HCl is chloride is a hard ion. Okay, it's the proton could add to any hydroxide to neutralize it. So that's part of, that's considered part of the water. So if you're adding HCl, you're adding chloride ion, and we could adjust the pH based on of a basic solution based on adding HCl. You can do anything you want to add to it. As long as you know what the pKa is, you can do it. All right. So I've shown you two tools. The tools are available up on the website for you to use. Um, the book will tell you what the underlying principles are for all of these things. That's the end of our lecture here, and I encourage you to buy the Bioseparations book. We talk about physical properties of biomolecules, how those can be exploited, so we can talk about solubility, size, ionization um, of, the, of biological molecules, how to calculate those. The uh, solubility parameters are discussed, there's a whole chapter on that. And then how you can exploit those in chromatography, in electrophoresis, in precipitation, uh, and so on, how you can exploit those properties to affect bioseparations and develop bioseparation strategies. Um, and so I encourage you to get the book. This is just one little part of the book to entice you into that. Thank you.